blood of the Lamb. We just thank you again for your holy Shabbat. We thank you, Father, that this is the day that you've made, that we can rejoice and be glad. And I just ask that you would just open the eyes of our understanding, that you would enlighten us to the hope of your calling. Today, as we study your Torah, as we get into your word, we just give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Shem Yeshua, Mishiach Hallelujah. Amen and amen. All right, well, we've got a treat today. Brother Ilya is going to share with us. I've asked him to share, and I don't know if he's... There he is. All right, brother. Why don't you come forward and minister to us the word. Do you want to speak from up here or down there, or do you care? It doesn't matter. Do I have to have the mic? Yeah, it's best to use the mic so that it'll pick up. Ooh, I'm stirred up. I'm stirred up. Hallelujah. You know, it's when, um, you know, we're close to the Father's uh, holy days when the weather just comes breezing in. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's breaking up that Oklahoma humidity. So, um, I know what it's like to be down, um, and we are supposed to stir ourselves up, but sometimes even with the best company, <clears throat> we, can't, we can't get that battery charged. And the Father knows that. That's why, that's why he sets up his Moedims, his, his, his times, because when we show up, he's there. I mean, the table is set. It's set and the seats go on and on and on at that big table and he just wants to bless his children and some of us choose to show up and get our batteries recharged and receive that blessing and some of us don't. So we have to be mindful of that and you cannot miss that. And so the point that I want to make is in this precious time the enemy will do anything to prevent you from showing up and pulling out that chair with your name on it and sitting in front of that table. He will do anything. And, um, you know, we, I want to be, I want us to, to really think about how we start our services and how we finish them. Everything's about blessing, right? We talked about blessing here and showing up to feasts is a blessing. And so we bless the children, we bless the wives. We bless our neighbors. We bless our co-workers. When we finish the service, Daniel does a, a, a prayer over us. He doesn't do it in the ironic way. He does it after the eternal priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood. That's the priesthood that we belong to because we're the, the heirs of, of that. So that's, that's our heritage. And so I want to think, I want to really focus on the blessing part. Um... Like I said, when during this time, the enemy will do anything to prevent you from showing up. And he will use people in your family, in your congregation, your co-workers, people on TV, the teachers on TV, whoever. He'll, he will try to deter you from, from, from coming close to him. And I can't help but to, to think of my boy Nehemiah. That's my guy, Nehemiah. Okay, Nehemiah, if you want to call him. And the verse that really speaks to me year after year and every day is 611. Would a man such as I flee, okay? When you think about Nehemiah and all the opposition that he had, he had people, there were naysayers. They were against rebuilding the temple, putting the things back in order so things can be accomplished in, in unity. He had so much opposition every single day. But he asked that question, should a man such as I flee? And so, men, my beloved brothers, I want you to think about that. And my sisters, would a woman such as I flee? You know, ask yourself that question because you're a woman, you're a woman of praise and, uh, and of virtue, just as the blessings that people did over their wives. So you really have to be mindful of that. Think, that's how you build yourself up. You remind yourself, who am I? You know, Philippians tells us, we read that Paul is writing, I can do anything through the Messiah. You can do anything. You're a child of God. So, in ne Nehemiah's days, there were all these people trying to come out from the outside 
And I, 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 I want to make a distinction between the inner and outer courts. They're coming from the outside, which isn't uh, kind of synonymous with the outer courts. And they're trying to get people from the inner courts, that intimate area. It's almost like the bedroom between a husband and wife. They're trying to come into the inner courts of God and sway people and pull them out of that intimate unity they're a part of. And they will do anything. I mean, they're snake oil salesmen. They'll sell you a bunch of garbage, a bunch of rubbish. Just to, just to put a lasso around you and pull you out. They were doing it. They were, they were Canaanites. Trying to sell people stuff on Shabbat. And Nehemiah's, I mean, that's why I call Nehemiah's my boy. Because I got a little bit of that boisterous in me. Like, I, I want to duke it out sometimes. But I have to remember, hey, I'm a new creature in the Messiah. Okay? So, but he was very protective. Very protective over the sheep that he was, he was governing. Okay, and this is why we read when we finish Zechariah at the end of at the end of uh, Zechariah we see there'll be no more a Canaanite in the day. Canaanite equals merchants. You're never going to see Canaanites selling their rubbish in the kingdom of God. No more of that. They're not going to wave. Oh, look, this season's pair of shoes, you know, or. Whatever it is, the new model car, there are going to be no more of these salesmen trying to lure you away. And so, the inner and outer courts, the world has, like I made, I made the example of family members and, uh, and colleagues and um, just anybody in that outer realm trying to come in and, and sway us and pull us out. And so, when we show up, we experience the most incredible unity with the Father. And the enemy knows that. Unfortunately, I think he knows the, the appointed times better than we do sometimes. He knows that very well. And so he knows he'll do anything to keep you out. Because if you don't, if you don't show up at that table, nobody's going to fill your seat. Your name is on that seat. Nobody's going to punch your ticket for you. Either you show up or you don't. And so I want to, I really want to think about, really want to, since I'm stirred up, I hope I rub off on you. Yeah. You have, you don't, you don't have a say in it. I hope I, my greasy stuff goes all over you guys, okay? And so I want to admonish you with that and uh, edify you with that. Um, A great anointing takes place when people come together. Satan knows that. And year after year, I can't tell you. I mean, something always happens where somebody or something... I'm sorry I can't even put it into words. It's, it's, I just know it's a battle. And it's always... It's, it's never a coincidence. It's always... It's strategic because... Satan is strategic, and he always tries to keep you out. And it happens with a bunch of nonsense sometimes. And, and we have to, the, the one thing, if I, could, if I could leave you with anything, is we're never going to disagree on anything. And that's fine. We're all children. We're not teenagers of God. We're not adults of God. We're all children. And I, as you figured out, I call you all siblings. So you're my beloved siblings. We're all equal heirs of salvation. And we're, we're learning as we go. And sometimes we have to step back and say, okay, well, I was wrong there. And, but the main thing is that when you huddle together, there's a great anointing that takes place. And recently, I want to, um, my wife shared with me something that happened in, uh, I think it's Sepulpa. And Brooke, if you're watching, you can correct me when I get home. But um, there was a, a revival or something like that were taking place in a local church. And I don't know what kind of denomination it was. But people are in one accord and they were praying and shouting and just worshiping the Father. Somebody called the fire marshal and said, the church is on fire. I'm like, uh, babe, tell me this story again. You know, I'm like, I'm missing something. Somebody perceived that that building where all the members, I don't know how many of them, 20, 1,020, whatever, they perceived, somebody from the outside perceived that that, that building was on fire. They saw flames. Hallelujah!
Hallelujah. That's awesome. And so the fire marshal's like, what are you talking about? Are you on drugs? You know, I just, I drove by there. There's no fire. So I just, you know, that's, that's what I'm talking about. There's unity when we come together and we pour our hearts out for the Father. There's a great thing taking place. And so before we come to the, the feasts, we're told by our master to, you know, work out your own salvation. Your neighbor's not going to do it for you. Your wife is not going to do it for you. Your grandkids are not going to do it for you. You are responsible. Okay? Don't listen to some schmuck who's beating a Bible down all the time, but he's not even living by it. Okay? Look for the people who are legit, who are consistent, who live by the word. And... Um, I lost my train of thought, but it's okay. So on that note, before we show up together, I mean, we know we're gonna, there's going to be a collective fast, fasting taking place for, from Yom Kippur for Day of Atonement. And while we're doing it individually, we're also doing it collectively. So I really want us to think about what are we to accomplish? You know, because if we remain the same year after year, there's something very wrong here. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're, if you're not being refined, if you're not welcoming that big chisel and hammer from the Father's hand, there's something spiritually wrong with you. Okay? Yeah. You're resisting the prodding of the Holy Spirit, which we have to be in the image of Elohim. So I really wanted to think about, uh, us to think about that Whatever, whatever we're going to be doing collectively, let's think big. Let's re think really big. Let's be that congregation in, in Sepulpa that the building is on fire, that people are calling on us. Yeah. And we're walking out. I'm like, what are you talking? Yeah, I am on fire. I'm stirred up. Hallelujah. Yeah. <clears throat> but in order to get that done, I was, I was talking about this with my brothers last, last week. In order for us to be partakers of good nutritious bread we have to starve as ourselves I don't know if people really understand that in order to eat you have to starve do you, does, does that make sense to anybody or is it just crazy Belarusian mind speaking out in, for, in order for you to eat something you have to starve you have to put away your desires put away the growlings of your stomach and there's a lot of things that need to be worked out in every assembly. And we're not going to accomplish that if we don't do that. And I think we have to practice that weekly because whatever day we may choose, I think we're going to come to, it's almost like a weekly rehearsal, putting things aside so we can get and receive the bigger anointing, a bigger picture. And there's, I've, I've personally wit witnessed incredible rewards by doing that personally and in assembly wise because sometimes we get we fall down and we forget about a brother or sister that may be falling down and they're they're uncertain and we we might think selfishly well that's you know that's their problem no if you're love to if you're to love your neighbor and love your brother you're supposed to cast aside your own personal agenda and and starve starve yourself let the Father fill you. Forget, you'll forget about the physical bread really quickly. You'll be focusing on the bigger, bigger issues in our congregation. And I want to give an, uh, uh, um, also a times where I've been, I don't know, like maybe my batteries weren't charged up all the time. And I felt, well, I don't, I don't feel like coming. I don't feel like hearing Daniel speak. Uh, and or somebody else, and I want to stay at home in my pajamas and and get my Shabbat on at my house. That is exactly the time that you put on your Shabbat shoes and you get your butt over to the congregation because that's the time that you need recharging. That's I, I can't tell you your 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 absence is not greater than your presence. That's the time that you need to be there, and so. I've, I've dealt with that personally all the time. And um, the anointing that takes place is recently when I've been stirring up and, and studying things 
I've been even just, I speak out loud. I, I sound probably like a crazy person in my own house because I walk around, I, I, I speak scripture. Oh, and then my wife walks in like, who are you talking to? <laughs> you know, talking to the Father. I'm just, I'm not yelling at him. Yeah. Yeah. Forbid, but it's, I just, I speak things out because I learn that way. That's how, that's how Ilya works. And, um, I've been praying about a certain topic and then next Shabbat Daniel is speaking on it. Now I don't know if the guy like jacked my house or something or listening into my conversations. I don't think he's that tech savvy. <laughs> but but there's great anointing. It's I think when when we when we really desire to do something, the Father gives us that answer. And so I really encourage everybody here to, to think about what you're going to do to the body. And the negativity that people project on you is, oh my goodness, I mean, I don't have the words to tell you. This is why, this is why the Father tells us, can, can the blessings and cursings come out of the same mouth? It's impossible. You can't do it. I project blessings over you. You're my siblings. I love you. Show up to Sukkot. The Father's going to be there. Your names are going to be on those chairs. Nobody's going to fill your seat. That chair's going to stay empty. It's going to stay empty this year and the next year. Nobody's going nobody's to clone you, okay? Show up. And you're going to get blessing by the right hand because our master's going to be there. And so, m people will project negativity all the time. And we project blessings all the time. We bless our children. We bless our wives. And I also want to tell every guy who's a husband here and future husbands, your marriages will blossom. I've only been married for six years. I'm a rookie, okay? But I know Father's blessings because I know what a life is like not living according to His Word. Okay? When you get your act in order and you listen, listen to the master, I mean, he will bless you beyond your means. And there are ankle biters all around the world. They're trying to bite your ankles and prevent you from walking and, and taking on your heritage, your land. And they're trying to pull you out of the inner courts. All those, the jealous ones, those who don't understand scriptures, they're the ankle biters. Forget about it. If you constantly look down to stepping on toes, you're not going to see where you're going. Okay? Look ahead. You're going you're gonna to step on toes. And it's fine. Step on them. Keep walking. Okay? Focus on the blessings because you can't afford, none of us can afford to, to miss out on that blessing. Because that blessing is not the blessing that Daniel is going to do at the end of the service. This is the Father's blessing on his appointed times. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we, our batteries might be down and we need that spiritual recharge. He knows that. And when we show up, I mean, that anointing lasts for the, for the following feasts. He knows that. I mean, he created us. And he knows how we operate. There's no, better, there's no better blesser and creator. Um, let me think of something else that I'll be miss. Oh yeah, the the part about the marriage. If you start blessing your wives every single morning, every single morning before you leave your house, before you leave those inner courts of your house, and step your foot out into the outer world, that world does not love you. That world is not your friend. That world will cease to exist before you leave that house. Put your right hand the always the right hand of the blessing and speak over your wife doesn't matter if she's sleeping or she's awake do it do it watch it watch it completely transform your lives you have to have that cuz when you as soon as you step out the world's going to project negativity on you and you're going to like what shoot your fiery darts i'm fine i'm fine I think a brother Carlos posted this really beautiful video on Facebook about lions running together on the road. What a beautiful image. I mean, there was like a, what, Carlos, like a pack of 40 or something or 100. It's crazy. And they all have this, 
this fierce look like they're they know exactly what they're doing where they're going they're focused that's us you know we're running into the inner courts with that fierce look you better not you know step back so I encourage everybody um, really just join the pack join the the lion pack and 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 run with us forget forget the ankle biters the the little yeepy dogs and all those people that are trying to hold you behind and uh, let's really let's really think about the gravity of of what we're coming into we're coming into the camp where Yeshua is you better take off your sandals you better be clean before you show up on the camp spiritually physically and let's do that together let's really admonish ourselves and receive proper uh, correction when we're wrong and edify most importantly just edify ourselves speak those blessings because the more we do it I mean that's we're gonna be the true light we're gonna be these buildings that are on fire that are people calling us calling the fire departments on it's it's let's be Nehemiah let's be Nehemiah let's be what a woman as I not me flee what a man such as I flee like that standard that that whatever courses through your blood don't ever flee stand the ground you're always going to come up against re, uh, certain opposition just as he did stand your ground there's a time to flee there's a time to stay and and receive a blessing so I just I that's the only thing I want to tell you guys with just bless each other constantly and let's let's really be a light in the world and be let's be different All right, brother. Yeah. thank you hallelujah brother Ilya Konachuk that is an encouragement I've been praying this week and just seeking the father and we're gonna be under attack the thing is we need to draw together as a body and and he kind of put it on my heart. I think we need to start getting together for regular prayer. And maybe even regular fasting. I'm, I'm thinking maybe Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, about 6 or so. We can talk about it later. Tomorrow, obviously, we're going to Arkansas, so we can't start yet. But let's pray about doing that. Just having a prayer meeting. Just like Brother Ilya is talking about. We can have revival in our midst. We can come together and pray. Come, to, come stir it up. We'll stir each other up. But let's start moving in the gifts of the Spirit. We can do that together. Let's start meeting on a regular basis and doing that as a body. And we're going to see some strongholds broken down. I think that he's really wanting us to do that. Well, I'm not going to teach as long as I normally do on our Shabbat message. I knew that we were going to have a good word from our brother Ilya, but I want us to look at a couple things anyway. And uh, the Torah portion is Nitzavim, which means standing. And we'll start reading in Devarim or Deuteronomy 29.9. This is Moshe speaking. It says, Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. All of you stand today before Yahweh your God, your leaders, your tribes, your elders, your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into covenant with Yahweh your God and into his oath, which Yahweh your God makes with you today, that he may establish you today as a people for himself and that he may be God to you, just as he has spoken to you and just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. I make this covenant and this oath not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today before Yahweh our God, which is the stranger. You don't have to have the physical blood of Abraham running in your veins. You can be a stranger, but it's all about covenant. He stands before Yahweh our God as well as with him who is not here today, here with us today. So he's talking about the future generations as well. We're entering into the same covenant. The covenant with Yahweh, our God, our Elohim. And it wasn't just made with our forefathers, but the thing is, once we enter this covenant, 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob become our forefathers. We have a history. The book is all about us, about our forefathers. So we enter into the same covenant. Now let's look at Deuteronomy 31, starting at verse 10. It says, Moshe commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time of the year, of release at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before Yahweh your God in the place which he chooses, this is talking about the Moedim, the Moed of Tabernacles, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear Yahweh your God and carefully observe all the words of this Torah. And that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear Yahweh your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. The Torah is to be obeyed by all that fear Yahweh. It is for all of us, men, women, stranger in our midst. Whether you're circumcised or not, it's for the whole commonwealth of Israel. And let's look at Ephesians 2.11. Paul explains a little bit about this commonwealth of Israel. He says, therefore... Remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is in the circumcision made in the flesh by hands that at that time you were without Messiah being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah brought near to the covenants of promise, to the commonwealth of Israel, to the God of Israel. In Galatians, he says, if you be Messiahs, then are you Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Skipping down to verse 19, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Natural branches are grafted in. We are one in Messiah Yeshua. The Torah is for all the commonwealth of Israel, whether circumcised or not. As our half Torah portion points out, not all will be married to Yahweh. There is an intimacy that we can have. Even if you weren't born as the seed of Abraham, even if you weren't circumcised on the eighth day, we can enter in if we so choose. Let's read it, Isaiah 61.10. I exult for joy in Yahweh. My soul rejoices in my God, for He has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has wrapped me in a cloak of saving justice, like a bridegroom wearing his garland, like a bride adorned in her jewels. For as the earth sends up its shoots, and a garden makes seeds sprout, so Lord Yahweh makes saving justice and praise spring up inside of all nations. 62.1 About Zion I will not be silent. About Jerusalem, I shall not rest until saving justice draws for her like a bright light and her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will then see your saving justice and all kings your glory. And you will be called a new name which Yahweh's mouth will reveal. And you will be a crown of splendor in Yahweh's hand, a princely diadem in the hand of your God. No more, no more will you be known as forsaken or your country be known as desolation. Instead, you will be called my delight is in her, and your country the wedded. The land of Israel and his people, there's a oneness there. For Yahweh will take delight in you, and in your country will have its wedding. Like a young man marrying a virgin, your rebuilder will wed you. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so will your God rejoice in you. The nations or the uncircumcised who are saved are distinct from Israel. The ones Yahweh will marry through Yeshua and will bring their glory and honor to the Lamb's wife, the New Jerusalem. Let's look in Revelation 21. 1. We were taught in the past that if you're Messiah's, then you're going to be part of his bride. But that's not necessarily the case. We've studied this in the past. There's going to be wedding guests and there's going to be the bride at the wedding feast with the groom. We can choose what we are, though. In Revelation 21.1, it says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
skipping down to verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the last seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Skipping down to verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the Lord, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. The kings of the earth bring their glory and honor to it. So these nations, the uncircumcised, that are still saved, will come to this, the Lamb's wife, the new Jerusalem. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So this is the new heavens and the new earth. Not everybody is part of the Lamb's wife. There are these nations that are saved, and they're saved for all eternity. It's an awesome thing to be. But there's even a more intimate place that we can be. We can actually be part of the Lamb's wife. But there shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or causes an abomination or lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So everybody here is saved. Everybody here, is, has their name's written in the Lamb's book of life. And they're all saved for all eternity. But it's only physical Israel who's the Lamb's wife. We've got a long study on that with a lot of scripture that bears this out. But if you're not part of physical Israel, if you weren't born of the physical seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, circumcised on the eighth day, there is a way to actually become part of phys physical Israel. If Yahweh puts that on your heart, there's that intimacy that you can experience. In Exodus 12:43. Yahweh said to Moses, Mose and Aharon, This is the ritual for the Passover. No alien may eat it, no foreigner. But any slave bought for money may eat it once you have circumcised him. The physical circumcision has nothing to do with salvation. That comes from circumcision of the heart. Abraham walked in the circumcision of the heart for a number of years before God actually gave him physical circumcision. So it doesn't bring us into covenant, but it is a sign of the covenant that we have with Yahweh. He says, no stranger or hired servant may eat it. It must be eaten in one house alone. You will not take any of the meat out of the house, nor may you break any of its bones. The whole community of Israel must keep it. So physical Israel is commanded to keep it. Should a stranger residing with you wish to keep the Passover in honor of Yahweh, because it is one of his Moedim, all the males of his household must be circumcised. He will then be allowed to keep it and will count as a citizen of the country through physical circumcision, physically part of Israel. But no uncircumcised person may eat it. The same law will apply to the citizens and to the stranger residing among you. Now the New Revised Standard Version gives a little more insight. It puts it this way. It says, if any alien who resides with you wants to celebrate the Passover to Yahweh, all his males shall be circumcised. Then he may draw near to celebrate it, and he shall be regarded as native of the land. A natural Israelite through the physical circumcision. But no uncircumcised person shall eat it. So physical circumcision has a place to play. Titus, in the book of Galatians, refused to be circumcised because the Judaizers were saying, you have to be circumcised to be saved. And that wasn't what Torah teaches. I fully believe that eventually, Yahweh probably led him into circumcision. Timothy, on the other hand, was circumcised. His father was a Greek, but Paul had him circumcised. And the thing is, the difference between Titus and Timothy, they were both just as saved as one another. But Timothy could go to the temple with Paul and worship at the temple where Titus could not. No stranger that was uncircumcised in flesh could go to the temple and worship. So there was an intimacy through this physical circumcision that Timothy experienced that Titus didn't. But the thing is, just like with Abraham, when Titus understood it and that time was there and Yahweh led him into it, I believe that Titus probably eventually became circumcised because there's an in intimacy in there that you can't experience otherwise. It makes you part of the Lamb's wife, part of the bride. Now there's another part of this process as well that's brought out in Ezekiel 47. Starting at verse 21 it says, Thus you shall divide this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. 
we're back to the land again, which is part of our Torah portion. It shall be that you will divide it by lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. And we know that that would include physical circumcision also. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. So if you weren't born as one of the tribes, you actually can choose which tribe you want to be part of. Now, by default, we see the proselytes in Scripture, the ones that were not born as physical descendants like Caleb. His father was a Kenizzite. But yet Caleb was grafted into Judah. He was the representative of Judah when the ten spies went into the land, or the twelve spies. Um, Ruth and Rahab, they were both grafted into Judah. So, just by default, if you're part of the body of the line of the tribe of Judah, you would be considered part of Judah. Unless, when Yeshua comes back, this is talking, Ezekiel 47 is talking about the time of the thousand year reign when the Messiah himself is here. And the land, he finally restores the land, all the land that was promised to Israel, which has never actually been all, all taken. Solomon came close, but that Gaza Strip, where the Palestinians were, that never was fully realized. But yet, during the time of Messiah, all the land is going to be there. And then he's going to divide it up among all the 12 tribes. And you get to choose, as a stranger, which tribe you want to be grafted into. Everything but, Jew, uh, but, but Levi, because Levi didn't have an inheritance. You had to be born into that physical tribe to be part of that. But you can choose what tribe you want to be part of in the future coming kingdom. But the physical land of Israel is our inheritance. Those who are part of physical Israel. Now back to the Torah portion. Look at Deuteronomy 30 verse 1 and when all these words have come true for you the blessing and the curse which I have offered you if you meditate on them in your heart wherever among the nations Yahweh your God has driven you if you return to Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and obey his voice you and your children and everything that I'm laying down for you today then Yahweh your God will bring back your captivity he will have pity on you and gather you back from all the peoples among whom Yahweh your God has scattered you. Should you have been banished to the very sky's end, Yahweh your God will gather you again, even from there, and will come to reclaim you. Then Yahweh your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants so that you will love Yahweh your God with all your heart and soul and so will live. So bringing us back to the land is actually part, a major part of our covenant. In some of our backgrounds in, in the churches that we came out of, the land of Israel is really never even mentioned. We're going to go to heaven. I mean that's what is really pushed. But yet Yahweh says in his Torah that he's going to bring us back to our land, this place where he can dwell with his people and where we can have a physical inheritance and be with him. Look at Deuteronomy 11, 8. He explains why this is so. You must keep all the commandments which I enjoin on you today, so that you may have the strength to conquer the country into which you are about to cross, to take possession of it, and so that you may live long in the country which Yahweh promised on oath to bestow on your ancestors and their descendants, a country flowing with milk and honey. This is a major part of the covenant that he made with the our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the country which you go, which you are about to enter and make your own, is not like the country of Egypt from which you have come, where having done your sowing, you had to water the seed by foot, as though in a vegetable garden. No, the country which you are about to enter and make your own is a country of hills and valleys, watered by the rain of heaven. Yahweh your God looks after this country. The eyes of Yahweh your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the end. And this is why we go by the timing in Jerusalem, why we wait for the new moon to be seen there. The, the year begins and ends in this country of Yahweh's that he has chosen as his very own. It's a special place to Yahweh. He created it to have a place for us, his people, to interact with our Creator. And it's where our inheritance is. That's when Yeshua comes back, he's going to be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem in Israel. And his people are going to be drawn back to the land with him. In Isaiah 62, 1, again, it says about Zion, I will not be silent. 
about Jerusalem I shall not rest until saving justice dawns for her like a bright light and her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will then see your saving justice and all kings your glory and you will be called a new name which Yahweh's mouth will reveal. You will be a crown of splendor in Yahweh's hand, a princely diadem in the hand of your God. No more will you be known as forsaken or your country known as desolation. Instead you will be called my delight is in her and your country the wedded. For Yahweh will take delight in you and in your country will have its wedding. Like a young man marrying a virgin, your rebuilder will wed you. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so will your God rejoice in you. On your walls, Jerusalem, I have posted watchmen. They will never fall silent, day or night. No peace for you as you keep Yahweh's attention. And give him no peace either until he restores Jerusalem and makes her the pride of the world. This is the city of our king. This is where he entered when he presented himself. And they waved palm branches and cried, Hosanna! And this is the place he's coming to again where he's going to draw us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Verse 8, Yahweh is sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm. Never again shall I give your grain to feed your enemies. Never again will foreigners drink the wine for which you have toiled. No, the reapers will eat it and praise Yahweh. The harvesters will drink it in my sacred courts. Pass through, pass through the gates. Clear away for my people. Level up, level up the highway, remove the stones, hoist a signal to the peoples. This is what Yahweh has proclaimed in the midst or in the remotest parts of the earth. Say to the daughters of Zion, look, your salvation is coming. And that in Hebrew would be Yeshua. And with him comes his reward. His achievement precedes him. They will be called the holy people. Yahweh's redeemed, while you will be called sought after city, not forsaken. His people in Jerusalem, you can't separate. Jerusalem is the place that he's coming back to rule and reign from and where he's drawing us to, that place of intimacy, if we're actually part of his physical land. Now, we'll all be coming up for the Feast of Sukkot. We know that from Zechariah 14. All nations will come up once a year. But if you actually become part of physical Israel, we can have that intimacy year-round. We can be there with him in that holy place because that's, that's what he's got for his people. We are connected to the physical land as his physical people, as his physical covenant people, Israel. And the reason is this is where he's chosen to place his name forever. In 1 Kings 8.26 we see this. And this is something that I wish the Sunday church would get a hold of because this is an intimacy with Yahweh that we'd, we'd never known before. 1 Kings 8.26 he says, Now I pray. O God of Israel, this is Solomon praying, let your word come true, which you've spoken to your servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him, or can, cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Yahweh, my God. And listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying for to, before you today, that your eyes may be open towards this temple night and day towards the place of which you said my name shall be there that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes towards this place and this is why we we stand and we pray towards Jerusalem this is the place that Yahweh has chosen to place his name forever the Temple Mount in Jerusalem look at 1st Kings 9 1 and it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of Yahweh and the king's house, and all Solomon's desires, which he wanted to do. Yet Yahweh appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him in Gibeon. Or Gibeon. And Yahweh said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. There's a physical place on this earth that Yahweh has chosen to place his name there forever. And it is the city Jerusalem and even in the new heavens and the new earth it's the new Jerusalem that is the Lamb's wife it's a very special place to Yahweh and for his people if we really understand it if you've ever been to the land when you get to Jerusalem you know this is home I mean it's a place like no other place on the face of the earth and Yahweh's told us that he's placed his name there forever the physical temple's been destroyed, but Yahweh's name is still there, 
And Yeshua is going to be the one that builds it again. Now, I believe it's going to be built even before Yeshua returns. And just like the temple that was there in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost fully came, all the Jews were there gathered at Jerusalem because that's one of the pilgrimage feasts when we were supposed to be there. And the Holy Spirit was poured out. And early believers met at the temple daily. This was part the core part of our worship because this is where Yahweh had chosen to place His name here on this physical earth. I think it's going to be built again. If it qualifies just like it did before it was destroyed in 70 AD, it again is going to be a place of intimate worship with Yahweh. And then we know in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I believe it is, that the, the one that's the wicked one is going to sit himself in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. He's going to defile it. When Yeshua comes back, he's going to destroy it. There's going to be an earthquake that's going to level it. But until that time, it's going to be a valid place of worship again. But then Yeshua himself, it talks about in Zechariah 6, is going to build the temple that he's going to reign on, that, that it talks about in, Zechariah, or in Ezekiel 47 that we were just reading about. Ezekiel 40 through 47 is all about future worship during the thousand-year reign, and it's centered at the temple in Jerusalem, this temple that Yeshua is going to build. Zechariah 6.12 says, Then speak to him, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of Yahweh. Yes, he shall build the temple of Yahweh. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he, he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall between them both, be between them both. And I believe it's talking about the priesthood of Aaron and the priesthood of Melchizedek, because he's coming back as the, the priest of Melchizedek. He's not of Aaron, we know that, because Hebrews says that it didn't say anything about the tribe of Judah, about priesthood. But in Psalms 110 it does. Yahweh says to Adonai, sit at my right hand till I've made your enemies your footstool. And then he says, I've given you the nations and you're going to rule them with a rod of iron. He's coming back and he's going to rule from his throne in Jerusalem. The Torah is going to go forth from Jerusalem, we're told, in Isaiah. And he's going to rule as a king. And all the nations will come and bring their glory to him. But as we wait for the return of Yeshua, we have to keep our eyes and our hearts on the land that He's prepared for us. And we say this at Passover time when we go through the Haggadah, the order, the Seder. At the end of it, we say, next year in Jerusalem. Because this is where the heart of the Father is. And this is where His name is. This is where the place of protection is going to be that we've talked about before. When this temple is built again, I think that's what's actually going to draw us back to the land. Because that place of protection, when we see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, like Yeshua said, then Yeshua says, flee to the mountains immediately. Flee to that, that place that you're supposed to be in the wilderness. He's going to draw us back there, and it's a place He's prepared for us for protection, and then when He returns, it's where our inheritance is going to be. We're going to be with Him for that thousand years, and then ultimately in the New Jerusalem for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, we just thank You again for Your Torah. We thank You for this place that You've prepared for us, for the land of Israel. Oh, Father, we just thank you that you've placed your name there forever. We thank you for our inher inheritance there. We thank you, Father, for showing us your ways that we can be as intimate with you as we desire. Continue to draw us to yourself. Oh, Moshiach Yeshua, return quickly, I pray, so that it can be next year in Jerusalem, that we can physically be with you. How we long for that day. Until that time, Father, we're going to occupy till you come. You've made us a kingdom of priests, and I thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yivarechah Yahweh, Vayishmerechah, Ya'er Yahweh, P'navelecha, V'hunecha. Yahweh May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up His countenance towards you and give you His peace, His shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. We'll go next door and we'll bless Him for the bread and the wine and eat a meal together.
Hallelujah.